I don't know about you, but that anointing has got me shaking. Whew. Dear God, help me. <laughs> wow. Good morning, good morning, and good morning. <laughs> Come on, lift your hands to heaven. Tell them you surrender. I surrender to your peace, to your joy, and to your righteousness. In Jesus' name, glory. Hallelujah. <laughs> Whoo. Are you blessed? Are you flavored? Are you anointed? Are you appointed? Are you the salt? Praise God. Don't be the pepper. <laughs> Whew. Turn to your neighbor and say, you got it? You got it. Second Corinthians chapter 4, if we can get there. <laughs> In his presence, all fear is gone. Whew. Where am I going? Okay. Whoa. <laughs> oh, get us every get everyone drunk today, Lord. Everybody. Glory. You know why you're here? Good, tell me, will ya? <laughs> Is it hot in here or what? Oh. Fire! <laughs> That's good, babe. Thank you. Wonderful. Don't touch it! Welcome to Sunday Morning Live. <laughs> Whoa. Anyways, you know why you're here today? Because you're a lover of God's presence. See, there's a separation going on in the body. God is separating. There are those who are lovers of his presence and just lovers of his presence. Giving. <laughs> we're here because we're lovers of his presence. And that's a big difference. Now there's an area you got to maintain to be a lover of his presence. Amen. Remember in his presence is fullness of joy. Provision. Everything is in his presence. Deliverance and healing. Everything's in his presence. Fresh, fresh revelation comes from his presence. Why are there so many addicts in the world? Because they're actually looking for God's presence. Remember, the word lust means overwhelming desire. People are, in the world are in lust. Living under Satan's torment. That's what lust is. It's an overwhelming desire to get something. And many people are trying to get something they don't even know what they want. And because they don't know what they're looking for, they grab whatever is there to take drugs, alcohol, sex, whatever it is. They take it and hope for a fulfillment, but it never fulfills. Never. You know what they're looking for? Home. His presence. And they search and they try. They dig. They try to get wisdom from the world. They try yoga. 
New Age, tarot cards, witchcraft. And all brings them back into the same thing, bondage. Because all of that does is open a door to the presence of evil, preventing the presence of God access to you. So we're here today because we're actually lovers of his presence and we're here to shed off the old presence again. See, the old presence must maintain back of you, behind you, not in front of you. When there's a lack of getting God's presence, there's an increase of your presence. Then you begin to desire the things of the world again. Where there's the presence of God, there's no fear. Where there's the presence of evil, there's always fear. Always. And that's what the enemy produces. He tries to bring people into a place of deception. Then they accept it and they produce fear. Satan's greatest weapon is deception. His power is fear. Why? Because fear opens the door to the presence of evil. It always brings the presence of evil. When there's fear, there's evil. When there's confusion, there's evil. Listen, we are not fighting against things seen. We are fighting against things unseen. And one of the things that the presence of evil do always causes people to fight on the things in the physical, not the spiritual. See, when the presence of God begins to take place and there's an exchange, everyone that say exchange. Again, you and I live a life of exchange. We're constantly exchanging our past for the future. We're exchanging our presence for his presence. It's a daily exchange, constantly. You and I are always picking up the presence of this world, which is ruled by Satan's kingdom. He's called the prince of power of air. That is a presence. And in this presence, you and I are always being bombarded with. It's like they're always clawing at you. Always knocking at you. Always trying to put something in front of you. So that you agree with it. And you open the door. And then the presence of evil comes. It brings blindness. It brings hardness of heart. It promotes pride. And it promotes fear. That's what's going on in the world right now. With this coronavirus and any other viruses and plagues. Cancer was a, a, another plague too. These things are all been released by mankind. <laughs> Created in labs. Think about that. But God will use it to the good. Somebody's making popcorn. Hallelujah. <laughs> Sit back and watch the show. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Is everybody there? That's good. I'm not. All right. Okay. Verse 1. Let's speak it together. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not what? We don't want? Lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in the craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by the manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, that means the message of truth, it is veiled or blinded to those who are what? They're perishing. They're dying. And where are they headed? Hell. Well, I'm a good person. Bummer. Good people go to hell. What do you mean? Because you're eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's hell bound. But the tree of righteousness is heavenly bound. Amen? That's why it's called the tree of life. But even if our gospel is veiled over those, those who are perishing, whose minds, whose thoughts, the God of this age who is Satan in his kingdom has blinded, 
who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine on them or penetrate and change the way they think and their desires, which means a change of heart, which is the core of all your desires in your heart. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure. Everyone say, I'm a treasure. In an earthen vessel, that the excellence of the power of God may, may be of God and not of what? How is that going to happen? There must be a presence exchange. Amen? There must be a presence exchange. It says we are hard-pressed on every side. From what? The presence of evil. Yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal bodies. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal bodies. So then death is working in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believe, therefore I what? I spoke. I believe, so I speak, and I speak because I believe. In other words, we declare. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes. That grace, the plan, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. We don't give up. We don't quit. We endure. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet our in man, inward man is being renewed day by day from glory to glory. For our light affliction which is but for a moment, is working for us, not against us. So many times people are always caught up, they're more focused on the affliction, and they can't see the, beyond themselves. That's pride. That's where the woe is me always comes in. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us, a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. That means there's got to be an exchange of presence to see the things that are not seen. I'm going to share something real quick. As we were worshiping this morning, I had a vision. One of the things the Spirit said to me, and there was a mirror in front of There was a mirror that was in front of me, and a mirror that's in front of every single one. And he said, walk through the mirror. Walk through the mirror. Why? Because yourself is preventing you from coming to my side. See, people are more focused on what they see in the mirror. Not realizing who they are. Because the mirror brings a false identity. And who brings information to the mirror? Darkness. Darkness. Amen? So we're always looking at ourself, even in the mirror. But we must step through the mirror and leave ourself here. That means it maintains the identity of who we are in Christ. And that can only be done without, pre without a presence exchange. It must be a constant presence exchange. Well, we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are what? Temporary. Everyone say, I'm temporary. So is the mirror. 
But the things which are not seen are what? Eternal. The God of this age promotes the desire of selfish ambitions, keeping individuals in a state of blindness to the true reality of Christ, his love, his plan, his promises, and his blessings. Not loving his presence or his truth in this world, amen, prevents an individual from the power of God. The power of God main, is maintained by consistent exchange of the presence of ours for His. It is exchanging the presence of corruption for righteousness. We do this by corporate worship. Why? Because in his presence you get an opportunity. All of these words and everything that comes up to what? You are proclaiming. You are decreeing. And what are you proclaiming and decreeing? His promises. His healing. His deliverance. His rescue. His escape. His prosperity. By cooperating with him in this war and battles. See, because you're actually battling when you're praising and worshiping. And we're cooperating with him in this war and these battles that are going on. Remember, he wins every battle. So if you're not cooperating with his battles, you're losing. So we're cooperating with his war and battles against the evil corruption and destruction through their deceptive lies and their promotion of fear. We're to keep focus. In other words, living from the future, not from the past. Every second that goes by is a past. Every second that is, every second that is counted, one, is a present. Why? Because it comes in. You count it. One, two, three. It's a present. But then it becomes a past. After it's spoken, it's a past. After it's made its connection, it's a past. And everything, <laughs> and every second that is coming is from the future. In other words, it hasn't reached yet. Does everybody understand that? So we're always future is always coming towards us. We are in present. Amen? But if you're living from the future, your life is different. Why? Because you're always exchanging your presence for his presence. See, for me and you, it's like being on one of really call those things that constantly move at the airports. What are they? People movers. All right, well, there's another name for them. Conveyor belt, escalators. Oh, it goes up. All right. Either one. Come on, when you were younger, you always tried to stay in that one position, you know, while it's moving. Yeah, cool. And you thought it was neat until you stopped. As soon as you stop, what happened? You move towards the future. Amen? Hallelujah. <laughs> So we're to keep focus. Your future comes to you in the movement of time. We are to be stewards of the present pertaining to kingdom agenda. Remember, we may be living from the future, but we are in the present. Amen? Does everybody get it? This is where everything's happening, isn't it? This is where the future and the present are meeting. This is where everything's connected. People who are living from the past are bringing the past to the present. Everything is being brought to the present, and this is where the battle is. It's in the present. The battle's already won in the future. Amen? The battle is in the present, and you and I are stewards of the kingdom of God's agenda in the present. But that cannot be done unless there's an exchange of presence. 
That means you must become a lover of God's presence, not a lover of anything else. 2 Corinthians 3. You don't have to go too far. Second Corinthians three. For do we begin again to commend ourselves, or do we need to uh, a need as some others epistles of commendation to your letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle written in our where, our hearts. Why isn't your heart the core of all desires? Amen. You are the epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. In other words, you are known by your desires. That's what brings labels on people. Other people will label you by what you desire. You're a lover of God's presence. You become labeled as a lover of God's presence. Well, that person loves God's presence, man. That person's a worshiper. They're different. That's what separates us from other individuals, even in the body of Christ. You are epistles written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ. Christ. If you're an epistle of Christ, you're an epistle, you are an individual that's carrying the eternal presence, power, and truth of God Almighty. Amen? <clears throat> Clearly, you're an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, by but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that means your heart, that is of the heart. For we have such trust through Christ toward God, not that, are sufficient, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. We are epistles of His presence. I grab hold of this. We are the epistles of His presence and recorded acts of His physical presence. Does everybody get it? We are the epistles of His presence. We are the vessels of His presence. And also of His recorded acts of his presence in the physical when he was here. Ministers are messengers. They are carriers of his presence and love. They are carriers of his acts of love. What is a minister? He's a steward. He's a steward of his promises. The word says the letter kills and the Spirit brings life. Why? Because the letter kills not able to follow because of the lack of God's presence. If you can't obey the word, it will kill you. Amen? We are to be lovers of His presence. And we must fight for His presence. Then you can fight for His acts. Somebody got it. People are trying to fight for his acts without fighting for his presence. It doesn't work. Because the letter kills and the spirit brings life. Your presence must be in a constant state of exchange for his presence so that you may be guided and by him and comprehend his acts, be able to see what he wants you to see, Establish his plans of his will and proclaim his promises to mankind. Again, we must be a lover of his presence, not of ours. Is everybody okay? Oh, hallelujah. Let's go a little further. Verse 7. But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit, the ministry of God's presence, amen, of his breath, not be more glorious? 
For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. Why? Because his presence will always produce righteousness. For even what was made glorious had no glory in it in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds, their thoughts, their hearts were blinded. For even until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament or associated with the letter. Because the veil is taken away in Christ. What is Christ? The anointing. Amen? It means in His presence. In His presence, His truth, and His power. That's where the veils are taken away. That's why so many people walked away from the presence of God into the letter. They've walked away looking for the acts of God in the Word of God, but leaving His presence and the veils have come back. Now they've become religious. Self-righteousness. Their tongues have changed to a serpent tongue instead of a righteous tongue. They proclaim the things of self and worldliness instead of the things from the future of God Almighty. They're angry. They're bitter. They're accusers. Why? Because they're comparison of themselves and self-righteousness and everyone else can't equal to them. But even to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on their hearts. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, what does he mean by this? His presence. The veil is taken away. That's where we are now. We are trying to get people into the presence of God. They worship secular music and bring the presence of evil. They read secular books. They bring the presence of evil. They have temporary fulfillments of getting high, but it brings the presence of evil and brings torment afterwards. Torment is of the devil, not of God. Amen? But when one turns to the Lord, one turns to the presence of God, one turns to the anointing of Christ Jesus, the veil begins to come off. Now, the Lord is the Spirit in the presence. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom from all bondage. Freedom from all desires of addiction and perversion. Freedom from self. Freedom from fear. But we all with unveiled face beholding as in the what? Mirror. The glory of the Lord as being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. In other words, it's the presence of God that we must be a lover of that changes you. Listen. I accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in 1993. I didn't know the Word of God. But what I did was according to the Word of God. I didn't know that. But when His presence came and filled me and took me and brought me through the mirror, ended up on the other side. Everything that was of old stayed here. Everything became new. And when He sent me back, the mirror was no longer in front of me. He was. I became a new creation. Everything I wanted was his presence. I didn't even want to read the word of God. I was afraid it was going to interfere with his presence. That's all I wanted was him. I kept telling him, why do you want me to read the word of God? Just tell me what to do, I'll do it. I can hear you. I know, just tell me. I know your presence. I know when you come. I know what doors you're opening and what doors you're shutting. I, you bring me in dreams and visions. You tell me things to come. What do you want me to do? Just tell me. But don't make me read this thing. 
Well, he won. Hallelujah. I didn't understand at first. But as I began to read the Word of God, I began to realize it became food. But he said, never forsake my presence. Never forsake my presence. Become a worshiper. Maintain my presence. Then my word will become food. But without my presence, my word will become a stumbling block. And it's like, whoa. That's why we're here, because we love his presence. We're not afraid of catching each, anything. What we want to do is catch his presence. I want to be contagious. <laughs> Are you contagious? Yes, I carry the presence of God. Look out, homie. <laughs> Come out in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter three. <laughs> Glory. Three. Lovers of his presence. That's what's separating everything right now. You know. Remember, fear is not of God. Amen. Listen, you're not going to feel good every morning, you know. In fact, you might not feel good every night or during the day. And you may sense that little plague trying to come on you. I said little. It's like a mosquito that jumps on you, you know, tries to bite you. I mean, the bite is bigger than you realize, you know. Because it's irritating. I hate that noise of a mosquito. Man, I shoot my house down sometimes. I'm chasing that thing. I'm going to kill it. Why? Because as soon as I go to sleep, it's going to bite me. So I have to find it before I can sleep. Man, I got pillows out blank because I'm chasing this sucker until I kill it. But sometimes they're so fast. It's like the enemy sometimes, you know? Nothing but a stinking pest. Hallelujah. <laughs> I was going to go a little further, but I decided not to. <laughs> oh, praise God. But you know, you can hear that buzz. And there's a buzz of the presence of evil. There's a certain sense which we call a vibration because they release a frequency. There's a frequency of evil and there's a frequency of righteousness. They exalt, enlarge in their frequency through their music, which penetrates and puts people under mind control. Remember, they pray over everything that they produce. And curse it. They conjure up demonic forces and demons and attach them to every bit of music for 10 days or 7 days. 12 witches call it up. All the con and they conjure up all of these demons and attach them to their music so when their music goes out and people hear it, boom, it opens the door. Now they're addicted to that music. Why? It's an overwhelming desire. I got to have that music. Did you hear that? Wow. I got to break my piggy bank to go get that music. We should be that way towards the presence of God. Did you hear that music? Man, it brought the presence of God. Viv gets emails from me or texts all the time. <laughs> New song. Why? Because I'll be streaming I'll be listening to a song and another one will come up and go, whoa, that one's, and then, you know, shuffling through all of the songs. That one. Why? Because I'm looking for the presence. I don't need a message. 
The message keeps people out of the holy place. I need the presence. But it brings the people into the tabernacle, into the outer court. Amen? So the message is salvation. The message is Jesus and his power and his love. Praise God. Now I want to experience it. And it's experienced in his presence, in the holy place, in most holy place. But the enemy will try to bring even manipulate Christian music to keep people from the most holy place in the holy place where people are just listening to outer court music all the, all the time. And you know what? Now they're bound by the letter because there's no power. Now remember the gifts, the gifts are available to everyone. So a person can still speak in tongues and still have no power. Amen? People think that the gifts, they're supposed to be, there are power gifts, no doubt, but they're utterance gifts. But you must be careful because I know a lot of people that have been out there speaking in tongues and they're still voting for heathens, child smugglers, perversion, baby eaters, blood drinkers of humanity. What kind of Christian is that? They're not. They're not. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. Hallelujah. Let's speak it together. But know this, in the last days, perilous times will come. Man, we are in perilous times right now. See, every day we have the power to choose. Who do you want to serve? Every decision you have the power to choose. Am I going to make a decision that's pleasing God or pleasing myself? Everything is a place of position, of decision. Why? Because we are in the present. Amen? Remember the present. We're to be controllers of the present. We're to have dominion over the present. Because everything revolves around the present. The future does and so does the past. Amen? It says, for perilous times will come in these times, in these latter days. For men will be what? Lovers of themselves. Lovers of their own presence. Lovers of money. Boasters. Proud. Blasphemers. Disobedient. To parents. Unthankful. Unholy. Unloving. Unforgiving. Slanders. Without self-control. Brutal despisers of God. Traitors. Headstrong. Haughty. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the what? The power. And from such people turn away. Now, you know, when you look at this, it's because they lack the presence of God, so they lack identity. So they're trying to compare themselves with someone else in the world. They're trying to es express their identity by the things they wear. Amen. People express their identity by tattoos, by piercings, by the hair, by whatever. I mean, people turn up with orange, blue, purple hair. I mean, again, this is an area of why they're trying to express their identity. It doesn't make them bad, and they're deceived because they don't know who they are. Now, if a person shows up with tattoos and purple hair, and they're walking in Christ, their, Christ, their identity is in Christ, not in who they're, what they're wearing. It's different, but you'll know them by their fruit. Amen? I'll never forget the first time I went to jail ministry and my hair was thicker and longer. <laughs> Hallelujah. One of these chaplains came up to me and said, do you know the Bible talks about long hair for men? I wanted to call him a moron, but I didn't. He just didn't understand. I knew he had to be a... Baptist because he didn't understand the things of the spirit. He was all lettered. He was lettered up, but not spirit up. Because the area in the Bible is talking about men with long hair is because there was homosexuality, all kinds of things, cross jesting going on in one of the churches in the Corinth. They were, they were offering sexual stuff to false gods. And so Paul was telling them, stop doing this. You don't have to dress like this. You don't have to dress like that. That's not what's going on. Your identity is in Christ. But I realized then, man, welcome to the jail of political correctness. 
Well, we lasted in there for about 17 years, so we got thrown out of three of them. But praise God. Hallelujah. We left an impact, though. <laughs> Glory. Verse 6. It says, for this sort are those who creep into households, ministries, and make captives of gullible men, women, and children, load them down with sins, and led away with various desires for the world, lust, living under Satan's torments. I are always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. In other words, where is truly the knowledge of the truth? It's in God's presence. Amen? Knowing that Jan Janus and Jabiris resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapprove concerning faith. There is no faith. But they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifested to all as theirs also was. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, the truth, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, and perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch and Icium and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You will be persecuted. You'll be accused. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue, everyone say continue, in the things which you have heard, learned, and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And from that, from childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable for all doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the men and women of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Lovers. These individuals were not lovers of God's presence. They were lovers of their own presence. Amen? Lovers of money. They could not deny themselves. And that is required. To deny yourself, pick up the sword, pick up the word, fight and follow. They could not do that. In Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Everybody there? Mark ten seventeen. Now, as Jesus was going out on the road, he came, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but, the, but that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he said to the Lord, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Everyone say loved him. Because he knew that he was doing everything he could. But there was one thing preventing him. His desire of possession. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. And he said to him, One thing you lack... Go your way, sell what you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. But he was sad in his word, at this word, and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. How many of y'all know that you can't outgive God? <laughs> Man, he'd have sown that all, God would have doubled it. Now he would have doubled it in more ways than you realize. People would pay great wealth 
to have a visitation from the Lord. But God doesn't move by wealth. He moved by heart, a desire to know him. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, children. Now he called them what? Children. As a father speaking to his children. How hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the, a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Then Peter began to say to him, See, we have left all and followed you. And Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the Gospels who shall not receive a what? A hundredfold. Now in this what? Present time. And houses, and brothers, and sisters. Listen, look at how many brothers and sisters you've gained since you left yours. <laughs> and mothers, and children, and lands. But he said, you're going to have persecutions with persecutions in this age to come. And he eternal life. So he says you're going to have all these things with persecutions in this age but you're going to have even more in an age to come. For many who are first will be last and last shall be what? First. See we are stewards to fight for the possessions given by Christ. Not your own. Worldly ones fighting for their own possessions. What you receive from God is not yours. It's not yours to keep. Amen? But it's yours to upkeep as a steward until the next command of direction. Everybody get it? You and I don't own anything. Even this new pool table I got blessed with. It's temporary. <laughs> But I can use it and invite anyone to use it as a good steward to upkeep it until he says, get rid of it. Amen. Amen? And everything else we own, whether it's vehicles, motorcycles, everything is his. It's the problem is, is people are fighting for their possessions instead of being stewards of his possessions. Oh, Hallelujah. Obedience to his presence will result to a hundredfold return. In this present time and the future in his glory. Think about that. Ephesians chapter 2. Why? Because you're a lover of his presence. You know, the question always comes, do you want a new life? Do you want a new life? Do you want to increase in your new life? New life doesn't come without his presence. Maintaining a new life and expanding in a new life is his life. It says you and I are hidden in Christ. Amen? Amen? People that reject to assemble don't love God's presence. They're not lovers of his presence. They, they may love when they come in and get his presence, but they're not lovers of his presence. Because if they were lovers in his presence, they'd be in his presence, in corporate presence, and worship all the time. After I was first saved, man, the door couldn't, the, the door wasn't open enough for me. 
to be in God's presence corporately. And when I couldn't get it one word, I'd ask the Lord, where do I go? And he would send me somewhere else. Because he knew I loved his presence so much that when one place wasn't having it, I was at another one. I was at another one. I, was at, I stayed in his presence. Until I became more and more and more saturated. And see, then the boundaries that were in my life began to melt away. Because when you become a lover of his presence, he knows you're only going to go so close to the boundary. But that can't, people go over the boundaries because they lack God's presence. They know his word, but they can't obey it. Because the presence of God is not sustaining them because of the lack of it. So they try to justify themselves in how much quote, how much scripture they can quote. Oh, I know the Lord, yes, I can quote this, 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 and this, and even the devil can do that. Amen? The devil probably I'll quote every one of us in this room. But there's one thing he can't have is God's presence. And that's what defeats him. That's why we're overcomers, because we're lovers of God's presence, not of the enemy's presence. Ephesians 2, verse 1. Oh, hallelujah. Let's speak it. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, which is the presence of evil. The spirit who now works in the sons of what? Disobedience. Remember, Satan's great, greatest weapon is deception. People are not bad. They're deceived. You know, you and I were born with wanting to know what the truth is. What's the truth? Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? But the enemy brings confusion and delusion through all of his cursed items that he puts to people to keep them from knowing who they are, why they're here, where they're going, and a false reality. So you see, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, disobedience to what? God's word in his presence. Rejectors of his presence. So many people have exchanged medication for God's presence. Alcohol for God's presence. Pornography for God's presence. Gambling for God's presence. Some of them exchange food for God's presence. Verse 3, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. We're by nature children of wrath just as the others. But God who is rich in his mercy because of his great love which he loved us. Even when we were idiots. Dead in Christ. Dead in trespasses. He made us a what? Alive with Christ. By his plan you've been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Well, as that's present and future. Amen? That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by his plan, by grace, you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is the gift of love. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. That we should what? Walk in them. In other words, we are ruled under darkness. He kept us from God's presence and the acts of his presence. He kept us from the truth of his love, pure love, and promises. In Acts chapter 3. We see right now that that's a global battle. It is the global battle over the presence. See, but it's up to me and you. This is our mission, to drive out the presence of evil and darkness and deception and lies and to bring in the presence of God. But if you're not a carrier of the presence of God, how can you? Acts 3, verse 17. 
Let's speak it. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of his prophets that Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent. Repent means ask for forgiveness. When you do that, you're activating the blood of Christ so the presence has access to you. And be converted so that your sins may be blotted out so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ who has preached to you beforehand whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things. We are in this now. This transition. Remember, three world ones. Actually, the first world one, I want to explain a little bit here in a minute. Which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. We are in times of restoration. That means an area of restoring things. In this, we see in the three world ones, the first world ones to expose. In other words, bring transparency. Amen? And what was it going to do? Expose transgressions. Transparency. Transgressions. The second world one is a time of transition. That's what we're in now. But the first world one hasn't stopped. It'll still continue to bring transparency, exposure, and expose transgression so people can repent and turn from their ways so they can fall into the next phase of transition where things are being transferred. It's a transference of what? Your presence for his presence. Wealth. All kinds of things. There's a transition. There's a transference. And then the third world one will be the transformation where you get a new body. You be homebound now. That's where Jesus comes and takes us home. Amen? Repent is to activate the blood to cleanse unrighteous acts that open the door to the evil presence. That's what we're doing. We're shutting the door to the evil presence, so we, which is promoting your old man presence, so that you maintain the presence of the Lord. We are entering a new age of God's presence. Things are being restored. And will be multiplied. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Hallelujah. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. See, we're going to gather together, aren't we? Then why aren't we gathering together now? Hallelujah. We ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you. By any means, for the day of the Lord will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Now, we are in the falling away also. But it hasn't come to its peak. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, who that, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And we know this hasn't happened yet. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now... You know that what restrains, uh, what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. So what's restraining him is the body of Christ. Amen. We are the restranger, restrainers. We're in the present. Remember, the battle's in the present. Amen. So we're restraining him from overtaking completely in the present, even though he's ruler. The body of Christ is still here. Gathering, gathering, releasing his presence, releasing his promises, releasing his truth. Through who? The body, you and me, all the members. We are vitally important 
in this transition right now. Vitally important. It is important that we stay sanctified unto him and stay filled and don't let anything open the door to the enemy so that the presence of evil comes and takes you out in deception and delusion. In verse 9, or in verse 8, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will eventually consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy him with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be according to the working of Satan. With all power, signs, and lying wonders. And with all unrighteous deception among those who, are, who perish. They're perishing because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. That they might be what? Saved. Wow. We are sanctified. Sanctification starts off with a choice to exchange your presence for the presence of God. You're exchanging your presence for His presence. You're establishing His love for your lost. You're exchanging this. Your deceptions for His truth. And your acts for His acts. In 2 Peter chapter 1. Oh, happy days. Second Peter chapter 1. Woohoo. Verse 2. I was lost and now I'm found. I was dead and headed away to hell. Now I'm born of the Spirit and headed on the way to heaven. We are a fighter in the presence of God for His presence. We are fighters in this present time. It is up to me and you. So we must learn so we don't get burned. Amen? Verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Jesus our Lord. For his divine power, is his presence is divine power. Yeah. He has given to us all things that pertain to life. So what's he saying? Without my presence, you're not going to maintain life. And godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. By which we have been given, he's been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises by the recording of his acts. That through these you may be partakers of his presence or divine nature by be carriers, carriers of his presence. Amen. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So now you're in love. But you're in love with his presence. You are lovers of his presence. You're no longer living under Satan's torment. Amen? But also for, the, also, also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours, and you keep them and practice them, and abound, you will never be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ or his presence. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted. Why? Because the presence of God isn't there anymore. Even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. He's become lazy, compromised, and complacent. No longer fighting for the presence of God. Pride is coming and saying, I got it. I'm all right now. Well, I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't cuss. I don't do all these things. There's too many eyes. Too many eyes. That means that the, you've grieved the Holy Spirit with all those eyes, and his presence is all lifted. 
It doesn't mean he's forsaken you. He's waiting for you to repent so he can access back to those things and bring you back to a humble spirit who's willing to exchange his presence for the presence of the Lord. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent. Who am I? Hallelujah. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never what? You won't stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm going to close at Psalm 1. Glory. Psalm 1. Everybody there? Let's speak it. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man or woman who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, which is in the presence of evil. The world has, can never give you good counsel. Let me rephrase that. It can, never, it can give you good counsel, but it can't give you righteous counsel. It can only teach you how to manage, not be free. There's a difference. It's amazing to me how many Christians go to worldly psychiatrists and get counsels from worldly, or they get counsel from people that have fallen and offended or whatever. Bless is a man who walks not into that counsel, nor does he stand in the path of sinners and approve of liars, or sits in the seat of the scornful or bitter or unthankful, unforgiving. But his delight is in the truth of the Lord and in his presence and in his law he meditates day and night he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in its season in other words he is saturated with God's presence whose leaf also shall not wither and whatever he does shall what prosper but the ungodly the rebellious are not so but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the reward. That's what this judgment is. Nor sinners in the congregation of righteous. For the Lord knows the way of his people in righteousness, but the way of the ungodly, rebellious, shall perish. It's still baffling to me in how many so-called Christians forsake the assembling of God's presence. It baffles me. Hallelujah. Even worse, many of them don't believe the Bible is true. <laughs> but they call themselves Christians. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. We ask you to protect the seed that's been imparted. Let it grow and bear fruit for your glory. And keep us thirsty and hungry for your presence and for your righteousness. And as we get close to the area of lukewarmness, Lord, give us a slap. Let us awaken us, warn us, convict us, so we don't move any closer to lukewarmness or coldness or move out of the holy place into the outer courts. So, Lord, help us and guide us that your name would be glorified in every word, thought, and deed we do. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen.